So the first thing I want to bring up is why. Why are we talking about water retention landscapes? Why is it part of a living soil symposium? Why am I here today? Uh, and for starters, as Seth mentioned, we're 70% water. Water is life in a very meaningful way. Almost all life on earth is nearly 70% water. It's the ultimate capital of any farmer, and really it's the ultimate capital of humans on this planet. Our most valued resource and something really important to work with and cultivate. So this is a beautiful city, Bogota in Colombia. Uh, we could look at any of a number of different cities. This I bring because it's a really vivid example, because when it rains here, it pours. And you can see all of this area, everything in this picture is designed to carry the water away as quickly as possible. And even so, when it rains, the streets flood with water. Yet all of that water is carried away, taking with it all of the fertility, all of the nutrient, all of the sediment, the nitrogen that is pulling from the atmosphere. All of that is just moving away from the landscape as quickly as possible. And not only that, but you see, this is actually in a valley. These are the mountains above. So this city is not just dehydrating the area immediately around it, but this was most assuredly a valley full of wetlands and different water landscape. And through human action, it's not just desertifying this area, but all the other water that's flowing through that, the subsurface water, is also being diverted and carried away as quickly as possible. Now this is not just degrading the landscape right here, but it's also degrading the landscape below. It's causing more drought, it's causing more flood, it's drying up streams, creeks, springs, rivers, and it's flushing a, a whole ton of things that are not really intended to be in the water into the water system, clogging up all of those waterways, causing a plethora of problems. So I wanna challenge everyone here today as you go around through the world, be aware. Look at, what, look at where you are and look at what's all around. And look not just at what the landscape is currently, but try and get an idea of what it used to be in the past and the possibilities of what it could be in the future. This is Big Mama. This is a, an old growth cypress swamp that I was able to visit. This is a tree that was on this continent before Columbus arrived to Turtle Island. Uh, and it only remains because it was in a very hard place to log. They would have loved to cut this down, but it was too hard. And so there are just vestiges and remains of what used to be on the landscape. And if you think we go to the public lands, we go to the forests, many of these places that we think of as natural have already been logged multiple times often. They've been highly degraded, yet they're our closest relation to a natural system and what used to be, and so we work very hard to preserve them. This is where the whole conservation movement comes from, and now we're conserving a degraded landscape. So something to keep in mind. Another thing that I think this helps me remember is that when Columbus arrived on Turtle Island, you could drink out of any body of water on the continent. You could drink out of the rivers, you could drink out of the streams, you could drink out of the lakes. Now we know that that's not the case, we, and it's not the case by a wide stretch. You're not supposed to eat more than one fish. The EPA even says that you're not supposed to eat more than one fish out of the Great Lakes each year because the toxicity levels are so high. So this is one thing for us, but we can take water from the mountains where it's still clean, bottle it, and bring it to us. What about all of our other relations on this planet? All of the animals, all of the birds, all of the insects, all of the fish, they can't go anywhere for clean drinking water, and so they're stuck drinking our poisoned water. This brings me to Victor Schauberger. In my life, the best teachers have been people who spent their life in nature, learning from nature. It's not the politicians, it's not the professors, it's the people with real on the ground experience, in my experience. And Victor was a brilliant man who came to some really keen understanding of some really dynamic systems. I highly recommend you all look into his work around structured water, around a whole plethora of things, but what I want to talk about is the full and the half water cycle and how this relates to where we're at globally with the water handling of the earth. This is a valley where I've been living for the past decade or so. Uh, it's the Gallatin Valley. It's the biggest valley in Montana. It's the headwaters of the Missouri River. 
And this used to be known as the Valley of Flowers. This was a sacred valley by the native peoples where you had to lay your arms at the entrance of the valley because there were sacred medicines that grew in this expansive water landscape full of wetlands, full of water features, full of springs, creeks, rivers that grew nowhere else. And so all of the surrounding tribes claimed this valley as their own because it was a very important place for them. Now this valley is less than one third the water surface area that it used to be. And again, it's not just impacting this valley, but think this is feeding into the Missouri River, so it's impacting that as well, meaning more flood, meaning less consistent flows. When there's high flows, they're more than ever before, and then there's long periods of low flows as well in between. So I want to elaborate a little bit on the full water cycle and how that works. The mountains are a really key element to that. They're a collection source. They condense the rainfall and they channel it to certain areas where it can be worked and they develop different microclimates within the landscape. For me, this has also been a really important place to learn because it's one of the few habitats where we haven't heavily degraded the water cycling of the system because it's too hard to get up there. It's too hard to mine resources up in the mountains. Certainly forestry goes up to a certain extent, but when you get high up in the mountains, you can really discover a more or less untampered water system. This brings us to the forests, which are a really, really important key. The water moves from the mountains through the forest. And now one thing I want to bring up with the full and half water cycle is the importance of the temperature of the soil on its ability to absorb the rainfall. In a forest setting like this, where the soil temperature, it's shaded, it's nice and cool, and it can easily absorb the warmer falling rainfall. That rainfall penetrates into the earth, it soaks the earth body, and it goes through underground channels being filtered and cleaned, coming back up in the form of springs, creeks, brooks, all the different water bodies all the way down. When these forest systems are clear cut, as with modern forestry practices, that raises the temperature of the soil. If you think of, a, it basically turns it into a hard clay pot. And so now all of that rain, instead of penetrating into the soil, is running downhill very quickly. Now that's leading to more flooding during rain events. It's also leading to more drought. It's leading to a drying up of water reservoirs and a whole plethora of problems. So forests are a really key component in a water retention landscape. They're also one of the main factors and supporters of the fungi, which is really a neglected mega science. We have a whole kingdom that has almost no research until the last handful of years to an embarrassing extent. And these are really important regulators of the forest. They decide which trees come up, which ones don't. They regulate nutrients, they regulate disease, a whole plethora of things. This picture I love because you see the extracellular metabolites coming off of the fungi. One thing that people don't often know is that fungi actually create water. As they break down lignin and pull carbon and hydrogen off, and oxygen from the atmosphere, some from the lignin as well, they actually create water molecules as part of their process of growing. Uh, the other thing is that myceliated habitats are an incredible sponge, allowing that water to really infiltrate into the landscape and be held for a much longer time. These extracellular metabolites also contain a plethora of enzymes, acids, antivirals, antibacterials, messaging molecules, all sorts of really important things for the networking of our natural systems. And another thing is that fungi actually mineralize rock. Those oxalic acids that are coming out of those water droplets are actually breaking off, and this is a picture of mined rock where you can see some mycelium growing just on the rock, still alive, because they're actually taking those minerals from the rocks breaking them off with the oxalic acids they produce and opening them up to the living cycle. Then we move into the creeks and springs, deep water bodies where the water is flowing deep in the earth, it's staying cool, it's being oxygenated by all the bends and turns through the rocks, all of the bacteria that help clean the water are living in these kind of systems, another really important part of the system. Now, with the half water cycle, when the forest is cut, what you have is all your erosion and sediment washes into these river systems, clogging them up, causing them to flood the banks more. And what you have is instead of these deep 
sheltered bodies of water, you get flat, expansive water, increasing evaporation, and one storm leads to the next. Now, at the same time, this is actually sinking the water table because none of that water is penetrating into the earth. So this brings me to Plato. Um, this is over 2,400 years ago. This is a quote from one of his works. The land was the best in the world. There are remaining only the bones of the wasted body. All the richer and softer parts of the soil having fallen away, the mere skeleton of the land being left. In the primitive state of the country, its mountains and hills were covered with soil and plains, were full of rich earth, and there was an abundance of wood in the mountains. Of this last, the traces still remain, although some of the mountains now only afford sustenance for bees. The land reaped the benefit of the annual rainfall, not as now losing the water which flows off the bare earth into the sea, but having an abundant supply in all places, providing everywhere abundant fountains and rivers. Such was the state of the country, which was cultivated by lovers of honor and of a noble nature, and had a soil the best in the world, and an abundance of water, and in the heaven above an excellently attempered climate. Now that last piece I want to pull apart real quick, because this water cycle has a really big impact on our climate. A lot of these massive storms that we have flowing through is not just from temperature rise, but it's from the clear cutting around the equator that leads to these hot winds blowing and increasing the storms. Uh, and so there's a really big piece here to pull apart. In our modern society, we are really focused on symptom-based medicine. You see it all over the world. And I actually think, let me also preface this by saying, uh, my university education is in ecology. I was trained in climate science. Uh, I have a very good understanding of anthropomorphic forcings, of feedback loops, of albedo effect, all of those things. And I understand that there is certainly anthropomorphic climate change. But I've actually come to believe through my work around the world that CO2 is actually a symptom of the greater problem. And stress is the root of all disease. And I come to believe that it's actually the severe disturbance of the hydrological cycling of the planet that's the stress at the root of this disease of what we're seeing with climate disturbance. If you start to address that issue, you're going to have more life, you're gonna have more growth, you're gonna have more carbon moving into the ground. Um, I, if, from my perspective, to focus only on CO2 is to miss a very large part of the equation. And so from the very top to the bottom of the watershed, we're degrading it in a very severe state. If you look at human activity, anywhere you go, the vast majority of it is focused around carrying the water away as quickly as possible. All of our buildings, our roads, our farming systems, you see all these landscapes that have been specifically drained and now have drought problems all over the world. It's the same problem in different climates and different places. So what? I don't like presenting problems without presenting solutions, and so now I'm gonna go through some of the different solutions I've seen and worked on around the planet. This is my introduction to a lot of this. Uh, this is in Dayton, Montana. This is a place, is there a laser pointer? Yeah, the main button. Okay, we'll skip that. But anyway, uh, in, this area, the previous owner actually built a land, or, or sorry, an airstrip through a wetland. So they brought in a bunch of material, filled this in, and you can see there's a little water body here, a little degraded wetland there, big airstrip through the middle. And over the course of 11 days, we transitioned this landscape into this. And now it's a place that represents immense potential. You can go there and see tracks of every type of wildlife that's in the area. There is abundant ecological potential all around, and this was really quick work to be done that's gonna have a permanent impact until the next ice age. Now we go to an even more vivid example, a place that receives almost no precipitation for 11 months out of the year, and then heavy rains during that other month. This is in southern Portugal. This was a community of, it's about 150 year round, 250 in the summers. It's a peace research institute. And they came to my mentor, Zepp Holzer, a number of years ago, asking if there was a way for them to even live on this landscape. They were on deep borehole wells. They weren't producing enough water for the gardens, barely produced enough water for the community. And then in several short years, they made a water retention landscape 
where they are now, this is a before and after picture from roughly the same location. This is when they came to him without enough water, barely enough water to drink, not enough water to grow any of their own food, and this is that same landscape today. Uh, so they're storing water not just from the wet time of year through the dry time of year, but from the wet years to the dry years. So they're not just storing one year's water, but five years water. Now this community, instead of being on a deep borehole well, is on shallow springs and shallow wells, all recharged by their own water retention landscape. And if you think, I like to draw an analogy to the human body here. If our skin was dehydrated, so we stick a needle in our arm, pull out the blood, spray it all over the surface, it's a really degradative situation that's gonna go bad very quickly. And we're doing the same thing with the blood of the earth, which is the water. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful place. I'm gonna start going a little bit quicker so that I can show you more. So this is my mentor. I have a huge amount of respect and appreciation for him. Austrian mountain farmer who took this landscape that was known as the crap land, way up high, it's all stony. You couldn't really even graze cattle up there. You might be able to grow some grains. It was basically forestry land that wasn't useful for anything else. He made this beautiful paradise of 72 interconnected ponds and lakes and water features. And it's a whole agroforestry system. Incredibly productive, very lucrative, very low maintenance, and a really amazing example. Uh, and here gives you an idea of just how high up in the mountains he is. Way down at the bottom there is a village called Ramingstein. It's also known as the Siberia of Austria. And he's way up and above it. You have to actually go there to really understand how high and cold this climate really is. Um, and so it really goes back to the forest again, because this is an integrated water retention landscape of water features and terraced agroforestry systems. So it's not just the water that's being held in the actual water bodies that you see, but also in the land above, allowing that to infiltrate. His new farm is in a place with twice as much temperature and half as much precipitation. He still has the water landscapes, and he says there without the terraces and the trees, he wouldn't be able to do it because with this part of the system, water is feeding into these water retention features even up to two or three months after the last rain. This is what I consider to be an even more vivid example. This is in a place where it's 45 degrees centigrade and 50 kilometer an hour blowing winds for a lot of the summer. And he made a network of 16 different ponds and lakes. This is now the largest ecological point of interest in Europe. And having been there, it's really incredible. It's also important to note that these water features are built only with earthen material. This is very different from municipal reservoirs, and this is very different from liner-based ponds, because you're using the soil, rearranging it on site to the best of your abilities to hold that water, not just in the water body itself, but also returning it to the earth. So you're hydrating old spring lines, and you're storing not just the water in the water body itself, but everywhere uphill as well, because of the type of dams and reservoirs that we're creating. And now you go to this place and it's, it's absolutely beautiful. This is a picture I like to show because there's uh, these oaks that are in the middle. Another part of this story is that all the cork oaks were dying in this area. They were injecting them with all these different things to try and save them. Nothing was working. So they eventually brought sepulchrin and found again that they were trying to treat all the symptoms, not the root of the stress, which was the availability of water and the dehydration of the landscape. And so you see these vestiges of the old cork oak, some in the middle of water features. And so now you see there's a stork with swallows making their nest right underneath. And it's just, I saw so much wildlife and so many incredible things in one day there. It was really striking. And to give a contrast, here is only a handful of miles away, the municipal reservoir at the same time of year that you can see is about five meters low. And that's because it's about decentralized water retention, not centralized. With centralized water retention, they're draining everything to features where it's really designed to hold it as separate from the earth as possible because they want that water for irrigation or for drinking or for a plethora of different things. But when you have decentralized water retention, these ponds were low, but about a half meter low. Uh, very, it's a, it was a very striking difference to go to one and then the other right side by side and see the difference between small-scale decentralized water retention where the water is being returned to the earth 
versus large reservoirs, uh, which are a really unnatural system, and it's, it's hard for people to grapple, but there's a very big key difference there that's part of this water retention landscape work. And so that brings me to uh, the end of the talk where I just want to say we have a plethora of options. We have all the potential in the world. Working with the natural systems is a very easy thing to do. The hard part is the human systems. How are we going to manage those and how are we going to start to get people in a more synergistic relationship with nature? Uh, from the very top to the very bottom, there's incredible potential. Every climate in the world, every place receives enough rainfall. It's a matter of how many times it's used and how well it's distributed, how it's returned into the landscape, and how well the nature is managed. Uh, so we have possibilities from the top of the watershed to the bottom, from the driest climates to the wettest. I have friends doing the same kind of work in Saudi Arabia. I mean, very harsh climates, this kind of work is still possible. It looks different in every different climate, but there's an immense world of potential out there when humans choose to partner with nature.